welcome to day 10 of our Craplet Christmas Extravaganza, all audio, all the time, all Christmas. If you're just catching up with us, there are nine days of audio waiting for you at craftlit.com or at youtube.com slash craftlit dash channel. As I promised you yesterday, today we have another story by Lucy Maud Montgomery. If you want to go back to day nine and listen to the little, very little introduction on Lucy Maud Montgomery, you're more than welcome to. There are also, as always, links in the show notes at craftlit.com. And underneath the screen on YouTube, you'll find the same links. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more, you can tra-la-la over there and click on the links and take a look. Today's stories are Christmas at Red Butte and A Christmas Surprise at Emberley Road. Here we go. Enjoy. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories 1909 through 1922 by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Christmas at Red Butte. Of course Santa Claus will come, said Jimmy Martin confidently. Jimmy was ten, and at ten it's easy to be confident. Why, he's got to come, because it's Christmas Eve and he always has come. You know that, twins. Yes, the twins knew it, and cheered by Jimmy's superior wisdom, their doubts passed away. There had been one terrible moment when Theodora had sighed and told them they mustn't be too much disappointed if Santa Claus did not come this year because the crops had been poor, and he mightn't have had enough presents to go around. That doesn't make any difference to Santa Claus, scoffed Jimmy. You know as well as I do, Theodora Prentice, that Santa Claus is rich whether the crops fail or not. They failed three years ago, before Father died, but Santa Claus came all the same. Probably you don't remember it, twins, because you were too little, but I do. Of course he'll come, so don't you worry a mite. And he'll bring my skates and your dolls. He knows we're expecting them, Theodora, because we wrote him a letter last week and threw it up the chimney. And there'll be candy and nuts, of course. And Mother's gone to town to buy a turkey. I tell you, we're going to have a ripping Christmas. Well, don't use such slangy words about it, Jimmy boy, sighed Theodora. She couldn't bear to dampen their hopes any further, and perhaps Aunt Elizabeth might manage it if the colt sold well. But Theodora had her painful doubts, and she sighed again as she looked out of the window far down the trail that wound across the prairie, red-lighted by the declining sun of the short wintry afternoon. "'Do people always sigh like that when they get to be sixteen? asked Jimmy curiously. "'You didn't sigh like that when you were only fifteen, Theodora.' I wish you wouldn't. It makes me feel funny, and that's not a nice kind of funniness either. It's a bad habit I've got into lately, said Theodora, trying to laugh. Old folks are dull sometimes, you know, Jimmy boy. Sixteen is awful old, isn't it, said Jimmy reflectively. I'll tell you what I'm going to do when I'm sixteen, Theodora. I'm going to pay off the mortgage and buy Mother a silk dress and a piano for the twins. Won't that be elegant? I'll be able to do that because I'm a man. Of course, if I was only a girl, I couldn't. I hope you'll be a good, kind, brave man and a real help to your mother, said Theodora softly, sitting down before the cozy fire and lifting the fat little twins into her lap. Oh, I'll be good to her. Never you fear, assured Jimmy, squatting comfortably down on the little fur rug before the stove, the skin of the coyote his father had killed four years ago. I believe in being good to your mother when you've only got the one. Now tell us a story, Theodora, a real jolly story, you know, with lots of fighting in it. Only please don't kill anybody. I like to hear about fighting, but I like to have all the people come out alive. Theodora laughed and began a story about the real rebellion of 85, a story which had the double merit of being true and exciting at the same time. It was quite dark when she finished and the twins were nodding, but Jimmy's eyes were wide open and sparkling. That was great, he said, drawing a long breath. Tell us another. No, it's bedtime for you all, said Theodora firmly. One story at a time is my rule, you know. But I want to sit up till Mother comes home, objected Jimmy. 
You can't. She may be very late, for she would have to wait to see Mr. Porter. Besides, you don't know what time Santa Claus might come, if he comes at all. If he were to drive along and see you children up instead of being sound asleep in bed, he might go right on and never call at all. This argument was too much for Jimmy. All right, we'll go, but we have to hang up our stockings first. Twins, get yours. The twins toddled off in great excitement and brought back their Sunday stockings, which Jimmy proceeded to hang along the edge of the mantel shelf. This done, they all trooped obediently off to bed. Theodora gave another sigh and seated herself at the window where she could watch the moonlit prairie for Mrs. Martin's homecoming and knit at the same time. I'm afraid that you'll think from all the sign Theodora was doing that she was a very melancholy and despondent young lady. You couldn't think anything more unlike the real Theodora. She was the jolliest, bravest girl of sixteen in all Saskatchewan as her shining brown eyes and rosy, dimpled cheeks would have told you, and her sighs were not on her own account, but simply for fear the children were going to be disappointed. She knew that they would be almost heartbroken if Santa Claus did not come, and that this would hurt the patient, hard-working little mother more than all else. Five years before this, Theodora had come to live with Uncle George and Aunt Elizabeth in the little log house at Red Butte. Her own mother had just died, and Theodora had only her big brother Donald left. And Donald had Klondike fever. The Martins were poor, but they had gladly made room for their little niece, and Theodora had lived there ever since, her aunt's right-hand girl and the beloved playmate of the children. They had been very happy until Uncle George's death two years before this Christmas Eve. But since then, there had been hard times in the little log house, and though Mrs. Martin and Theodora did their best, it was a woefully hard task to make both ends meet, especially this year when their crops had been poor. Theodora and her aunt had made every sacrifice possible for the children's sake, and at least Jimmy and the twins had not felt the pinch very severely yet. At seven, Mrs. Martin's bell jingled at the door, and Theodora flew out. Go right in and get warm, Auntie, she said briskly. I'll take Ned away and unharness him. It's a bitterly cold night, said Mrs. Martin wearily. There was a note of discouragement in her voice that struck dismay to Theodora's heart. I'm afraid it means no Christmas for the children tomorrow, she thought sadly, as she led Ned away to the stable. When she returned to the kitchen, Mrs. Martin was sitting by the fire, her face in her chilled hand, sobbing convulsively. Auntie, oh, Auntie, don't! exclaimed Theodora impulsively. It was such a rare thing to see her plucky, resolute little aunt in tears. You're cold and tired. I'll have a nice cup of tea for you in a trice. No, it isn't that, said Mrs. Martin brokenly. It was seeing those stockings hanging there, Theodora. I couldn't get a thing for the children, not a single thing. Mr. Porter would only give forty dollars for the colt, and when all the bills were paid there was barely enough left for such necessities as we must have. I suppose I ought to feel thankful. I could get those, but the thought of the children's disappointment tomorrow is more than I can bear. It would have been better to have told them long ago, but I kept building on getting more for the colt. Well, it's weak and foolish to give way like this. We'd better both take a cup of tea and go to bed. It will save fuel. When Theodora went up to her little room, her face was very thoughtful. She took a small box from her table and carried it to the window. In it was a very pretty little gold locket hung on a narrow blue ribbon. Theodora held it tenderly in her fingers and looked out over the moonlit prairie with a very sober face. Could she give up her dear locket? She had never thought she could do such a thing. It was almost the only thing she had to remind her of Donald handsome, merry, impulsive, warm-hearted Donald, who had gone away four years ago with a smile on his bonny face and splendid hope in his heart. Here's a locket for you, gift of gold, he had said gaily. He had such a dear loving habit of calling her by the beautiful meaning of her name. A lump came into Theodora's throat as she remembered it. I couldn't afford a chain, too, but when I come back I'll bring you a rope of Klondike nuggets for it. Then he had gone away. For two years, letters had come from him regularly. Then he wrote that he had joined a prospecting party to a remote wilderness. After that was silence. 
deepening into anguish of suspense that finally ended in hopelessness. A rumor came that Donald Prentice was dead. None had returned from the expedition he had joined. Theodora had long ago given up all hope of ever seeing Donald again. Hence her locket was doubly dear to her. But Aunt Elizabeth had always been so good and loving and kind to her. Could she not make the sacrifice for her sake? <laughs> yes, she could and would. Theodora flung up her head with the gesture that meant decision. She took out of the locket the bits of hair, her mother's and Donald's, which it contained. Perhaps a tear or two fell as she did so, and then hastily donned her warmest cap and wraps. It was only three miles to Spencer. She could easily walk it in an hour, and it was Christmas Eve. The shops would be open late. She must walk, for Ned could not be taken out again, and the mare's foot was sore. Besides, Aunt Elizabeth must not know until it was done. As stealthily as if she were bound on some nefarious errand, Theodora slipped downstairs and out of the house. The next minute she was hurrying along the trail in the moonlight. The great dazzling prairie was around her, the mystery and splendor of the northern light all about her. It was very calm and cold, but Theodora walked so briskly that she kept warm. The trail from Red Butte to Spencer was a lonely one. Mr. Lurgan's house, halfway to town, was the only dwelling on it. When Theodora reached Spencer, she made her way at once to the only jewelry store the little town contained. Mr. Benson, its owner, had been a friend of her uncle's, and Theodora felt sure that he would buy her locket. Nevertheless, her heart beat quickly and her breath came and went uncomfortably fast as she went in. Suppose he wouldn't buy it. Then there would be no Christmas for the children at Red Butte. Good evening, Miss Theodora, said Mr. Benson briskly. What can I do for you? I'm afraid I'm not a very welcome sort of customer, Mr. Benson, said Theodora with an uncertain smile. I want to sell, not buy. Could you, will you buy this locket? Mr. Benson pursed up his lips, took up the locket, and examined it. Well, I don't often buy second-hand stuff, he said after some reflection, but I don't mind obliging you, Miss Theodora. I'll give you four dollars for this trinket. Theodora knew the locket had cost a great deal more than that, but four dollars would get what she wanted, and she dared not ask for more. In a few minutes the locket was in Mr. Benson's possession, and Theodora, with four crisp new bills in her purse, was hurrying to the toy store. Half an hour later she was on her way back to Red Butte, with as many parcels as she could carry. Jimmy skates, two lovely dolls for the twins, packages of nuts and candy, and a nice plump turkey. Theodora beguiled her lonely tramp by picturing the children's joy in the morning. About a quarter of a mile past Mr. Lurgan's house, the trail curved suddenly about a bluff of poplars. As Theodora rounded the turn, she halted in amazement. Almost at her feet the body of a man was lying across the road. He was clad in a big fur coat and had a fur cap pulled down well over his forehead and ears. Almost all of him that could be seen was a full bushy beard. Theodora had no idea who he was or where he had come from. But she realized that he was unconscious, and that he would speedily freeze to death if help were not brought. The footprints of a horse galloping across the prairie suggested a fall and a runaway, but Theodore did not waste time in speculation. She ran back at full speed to Mr. Lurgan's and roused the household. In a few minutes, Mr. Lurgan and his son had hitched a horse to a wood sleigh and hurried down the trail to the unfortunate man. Theodora knew that her assistance was not needed and that she ought to get home as quickly as possible, went on her way as soon as she had seen the stranger in safe keeping. When she reached the little log house, she crept in, cautiously put the children's gifts in their stockings, placed the turkey on the table where Aunt Elizabeth would see it the first thing in the morning, and then slipped off to bed, a very weary but very happy girl. The joy that reigned in the little log house the next day more than repaid Theodora for her sacrifice. Whoopee! Didn't I tell you that Santa Claus would come all right? shouted the delighted Jimmy. Oh, what splendid skates! The twins hugged their dolls in silent rapture. But Aunt Elizabeth's face was the best of all. Then the dinner had to be prepared, and everybody had a hand in that. Just as Theodora 
after a grave peep into the oven had announced that the turkey was done, a sleigh dashed around the house. Theodora flew to answer the knock at the door, and there stood Mr. Lurgan with a big, bewhiskered, fur-coated fellow whom Theodora recognized as the stranger she had found on the trail. But was he a stranger? There was something oddly familiar in those merry brown eyes. Theodora felt herself growing dizzy. Donald, she gasped. Oh, Donald! And then she was in the big fellow's arms, laughing and crying at the same time. Donald it was indeed, and then followed half an hour during which everybody talked at once, and the turkey would have been burned to a crisp had it not been for the presence of mind of Mr. Lurgan, who, being the least excited of them all, took it out of the oven and set it on the back of the stove. "'To think that it was you last night, and that I never dreamed it!' exclaimed Theodora. "'Oh, Donald, if I hadn't gone to town!' "'I'd have frozen to death, I'm afraid,' said Donald soberly. I got into Spencer on the last train last night. I felt that I must come right out. I couldn't wait till morning, but there wasn't a team to be got for love or money. It was Christmas Eve and all the livery rigs were out, so I came on horseback. Just by that bluff something frightened my horse, and he shied violently. I was half asleep and thinking of my little sister, and I went off like a shot. I suppose I struck my head against a tree." Anyway, I knew nothing more until I came to in Mr. Lurgan's kitchen. I wasn't much hurt, feel none the worse of it except for a sore head and shoulder, but, oh, gift of God, how you have grown. I can't realize that you are the little sister I left four years ago. I suppose you've been thinking I was dead. Yes, and, oh, Donald, where have you been? Well, I went way up north with a prospecting party. We had a tough time the first year, I can tell you, and some of us never came back. We weren't in a country where post officers were lying round loose either, you see. Then, at last, just as we were about giving up in despair, we struck it rich. I've brought a snug little pile home with me, and things are going to look up in this log house, gift to God. There'll be no more worrying for you, dear people, over mortgages. I'm so glad for Auntie's sake, said Theodore with shining eyes. But, oh, Donald, it's best of all just to have you back. I'm so perfectly happy I don't know what to do or say. Well, I think you might have dinner, said Jimmy in an injured tone. The turkey's getting stone cold and I'm most starving. I just can't stand it another minute. So, with a laugh, they all sat down to the table and ate the merriest Christmas dinner the little log house had ever known. End of Christmas at Red Butte. Recording by Elisa McCaslin. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1905 to 1906. Story 17 The Christmas Surprise at Enderley Road. Phil, I'm getting fearfully hungry. When are we going to strike civilization? The speaker was my chum, Frank Ward. We were home from our academy for the Christmas holidays and had been amusing ourselves on this sunshiny December afternoon by a tramp through the backlands, as the barrens that swept away south behind the village were called. They were grown over with scrub maple and spruce and were quite pathless, save for meandering sheep tracks that crossed and recrossed, but led apparently nowhere. Frank and I did not know exactly where we were, but the back lands were not so extensive but that we would come out somewhere if we kept on. It was getting late, and we wished to go home. I have an idea that we ought to strike civilization somewhere up the Enderley Road pretty soon, I answered. Do you call that civilization? said Frank with a laugh. No Blackburn Hill boy was ever known to miss an opportunity of flinging a slur at Enderley Road, even if no Enderley Roader were by to feel the sting. Enderley Road was a miserable little settlement, straggling back from Blackburn Hill. It was a forsaken-looking place, and the people, as a rule, were poor and shiftless. Between Blackburn Hill and Enderley Road, very little social intercourse existed, and as the road people resented what they called the pride of Blackburn Hill, there was a good deal of bad feelings between the two districts. Presently Frank and I came out on the Enderley Road, we sat on the fence a few minutes to rest and discuss our route home. "'If we go by the road, it's three miles,' said Frank. "'Isn't there a shortcut?' "'There ought to be one by the wood lane that comes out by Jacob Hart's,' I answered. 
but I don't know where to strike it. Here's someone coming now. We'll inquire, said Frank, looking up the curve of the hard frozen road. The someone was a little girl of about ten years old who was trotting along with a basket full of school books on her arm. She was a pale, pinched little thing, and her jacket and red hood seemed very old and thin. Hello, Missy, I said as she came up, and then I stopped, for I saw she had been crying. What is the matter? asked Frank, who was much more at ease with children than I was, and had always a warm spot in his heart for their small troubles. Has your teacher kept you in for being naughty? The mite dashed her little red knuckles across her eyes and answered indignantly, No, indeed. I stayed after school with Minnie Lawler to sweep the floor. And did you and Minnie quarrel? Is that why you were crying? asked Frank solemnly. Minnie and I never quarrel. I'm crying because we can't have the school decorated on Monday for the examination after all. The Dickies have gone back on us. After promising, too. And the tears began to swell up in the blue eyes again. Very bad behavior on the part of the Dickies, commented Frank. But can't you decorate the school without them? Why, of course not. They are the only big boys in the school. They said they would cut the boughs and bring a ladder tomorrow and help us nail the wreaths up. And now they won't. And everything is spoiled. And Miss Davis will be so disappointed. By dint of questioning, Frank soon found out the whole story. The semi-annual public examination was to be held on Monday afternoon, the day before Christmas. Miss Davis had been drilling her little flock for the occasion, and a program of recitations, speeches, and dialogues had been prepared. Our small informant, whose name was Maggie Bates, together with Minnie Lawler and several other little girls, had conceived the idea that it would be a fine thing to decorate the schoolroom with greens. For this it was necessary to ask the help of the boys. Boys were scarce at Enderley School, but the Dickies, three in number, had promised to see that the thing was done. "'And now they won't,' sobbed Maggie. "'Mad Dickie is mad at Miss Davis, "'cause she stood him on the floor today for not learning his lesson.' and he says he won't do a thing, nor let any of the other boys help us. Matt just makes all the boys do as he says. I feel dreadful bad, and so does Minnie. Well, I wouldn't cry any more about it, said Frank consolingly. Crying won't do any good, you know. Can you tell us where to find the wood lane that cuts across to Blackburn Hill? Maggie could and gave us minute directions. So, having thanked her, we left her to pursue her disconsolate way and betook ourselves homeward. I would like to spoil Matt Dickey's little game, said Frank. He is evidently trying to run things at Enderley Road School and revenge himself on the teacher. Let us put a spoke in his wheel and do Maggie a good turn as well. Agreed. But how? Frank had a plan ready to hand, and when we reached home we took his sisters, Carrie and Mabel, into our confidence and the four of us worked to such good purpose all the next day, which was Saturday, that by night everything was in readiness. At dusk, Frank and I set out for the Enderley Road, carrying a basket, a small step-ladder, an unlit lantern, a hammer, and a box of tacks. It was dark when we reached the Enderley Road schoolhouse. Fortunately, it was quite out of sight of any inhabited spot, being surrounded by woods. Hence, mysterious lights in it at strange hours would not be likely to attract attention. The door was locked, but we easily got in by a window, lighted our lantern, and went to work. The schoolroom was small, and the old-fashioned furniture bore marks of hard usage, but everything was very snug, and the carefully swept floor and dusted desks bore testimony to the neatness of our small friend Maggie and her chum Minnie. Our basket was full of mottoes made from letters cut out of cardboard and covered with lysome sprays of fur. They were, moreover, adorned with gorgeous pink and red tissue roses, which Carrie and Mabel had contributed. We had considerable trouble in getting them tacked up properly, but when we had succeeded and had furthermore surmounted doors, windows, and blackboard with wreaths of green, the little Enderley Road schoolroom was quite transformed. It looks nice said Frank in a tone of satisfaction. Hope Maggie will like it. We swept up the litter we had made and then scrambled out of the window. I'd like to see Matt Dickey's face when he comes Monday morning, I laughed, as we struck into the backlands. 
I'd like to see that midget of a Maggie's, said Frank. See here, Phil, let's attend the examination Monday afternoon. I'd like to see our decorations in daylight. We decided to do so, and also thought of something else. Snow fell all day Sunday, so that on Monday morning sleighs had to be brought out. Frank and I drove down to the store and invested a considerable share of our spare cash in a varied assortment of knick-knacks. After dinner, we drove through to the Enderley Road schoolhouse, tied our horse in a quiet spot, and went in. Our arrival created quite a sensation, for as a rule, Blackburn Hillites did not patronize Enderley Road functions. Miss Davis, the pale, tired-looking teacher, was evidently pleased, and we were given seats of honor next to the minister on the platform. Our decorations really looked very well, and were further enhanced by two large red geraniums in full bloom, which it appeared Maggie had brought from home to adorn the teacher's desk. The side benches were lined with Enderley Road parents, and all the pupils were in their best attire. Our friend Maggie was there, of course, and she smiled and nodded toward the wreaths when she caught our eyes. The examination was a decided success, and the program which followed was very creditable indeed. Maggie and Minnie in particular covered themselves with glory, both in class and on the platform. At its close, while the minister was making his speech, Frank slipped out. When the minister sat down, the door opened and Santa Claus himself, with big fur coat, ruddy mask, and long white beard, strode into the room with a huge basket on his arm, amid a chorus of surprised O's oh! from young and old. Wonderful things came out of that basket. There were some little presents for every child there, tops, knives, and whistles for the boys, dolls and ribbons for the girls, and a prize box of candy for everybody, all of which Santa Claus presented with appropriate remarks. It was an exciting time, and it would have been hard to decide which were the most pleased, parents, pupils, or teacher. In the confusion, Santa Claus discreetly disappeared and school was dismissed. Frank, having tucked his toggery away in the sleigh, was waiting for us outside, and we were promptly pounced upon by Maggie and Minnie, whose long braids were already adorned with the pink silk ribbons which had been their gifts. "'You decorated the school!' cried Maggie excitedly. "'I know you did. I told Minnie it was you the minute I saw it.' "'You're dreaming, child,' said Frank. "'Oh, no, I'm not,' retorted Maggie shrewdly. "'And wasn't Matt Dickey mad this morning?' Oh, it was such fun. I think you are two real nice boys, and so does Minnie. Don't you, Minnie? Minnie nodded gravely. Evidently, Maggie did the talking in their partnership. This has been a splendid examination, said Maggie, drawing a long breath. Real Christmassy, you know. We never had such a good time before. Well, it is paid, don't you think? asked Frank as we drove home. Rather, I answered. It did pay in other ways than the mere pleasure of it. There was always a better feeling between the Roaders and the Hillites thereafter. The big brothers of the little girls, to whom our Christmas surprise had been such a treat, thought it worth while to bury the hatchet, and the quarrels between the two villages became things of the past. End of The Christmas Surprise at Enderley Road Recording by Jadopi.